Okay, uh, first I just want to thank the organizers for giving the opportunity to speak. Uh, I hope we enjoy this conference. Uh, and I'm excited to be able to talk to you about something uh, more of the same, but slightly different, uh, not a rare phase particle, but a transitional uh, phase particle. So I'm going to discuss some neutron scattered measurements of this uh, fluoride particle, so you can also nickel. So I'm currently at Brown University, but this work, which was done as part of my postdoc while I was at Johns Hopkins University, and it was done with a uh, team of many collaborators. Uh, so of course, uh, my postdoc was supervisor, uh, Alan, who worked on neutron scattering experiments with me. Um, and theory work, which was really uh, driven by uh, Hitesh Chandwani, who uh, is currently at Johns Hopkins, but moving to Florida State University to start a position, uh, as well as Susie. The single crystal for this work comes from uh, Jason Krizan and comes with Bob Cavill, and neutron scattering measurements of the This Center for Neutron Research and the uh, So, of course, we're all familiar with the power of the light, so we've heard a lot about it today. Um, we've heard about um, spin ice, when you have icing ferromagnetic interactions. Uh, we've heard about or, or complex where you have a worldwide disorder and XY models. Um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is actually the Heisenberg limit. Uh, we think uh, this nickel compound is an example of a Heisenberg power core in the um, This is really an example of uh, at least a classical spin limit, um, but which was already mentioned. Um, the quantum question uh, is really not addressed. It's still a difficult problem, uh, theoretically, although we've heard a few of these in previous time. So I'm going to get to the Heisenberg model by quickly uh, moving through the Coulomb phase in the spin ice model, because I think more people are familiar with the spin ice model. Uh, of course, everybody here is familiar with it. We you know uh, we have this uh, Hamiltonian with Ising exchanges. You can write that as a sum of squares. Um, from the sum of squares, you can simply see the ground state condition that you have this two into a uh, or total spin or Ising. And of course, uh, in this case, you have macroscopic degeneracy for these low-energy states, uh, experimentally manifesting itself as some residual electric field that was famously observed in specific heat, so this uh, R of R, we have spin by If you coarse grain those spin degrees of freedom, um, then we know that you can describe the system now, uh, no longer in terms of spin, but some, some coarse grain uh, magnetic field, essentially. Imagine these spins defined in flux lines that are ice cold result in this divergence for the condition. Uh, and the experimental, the experimental consequence of that um, is that we get these pinch points, which essentially comes from uh, the long range power law correlations implied by the, by the diamond. Okay. So, this, this is what's essentially been dubbed a uh, cool phase because of this divergence for the condition. It turns out the Heisenberg model um, can also be described as a also write the Hamiltonian for the Heisenberg model in terms of the sum of squares and find where the square turns into the sum over all the spins on the tetrahedra. Then you find that the ground state is just given by setting that term equal to zero. Um, just like in the spin ice, however, in this case it's a little bit different. There are some, there are some dynamics in it, so there are many different states that can satisfy the zero spin condition. You can see that classically uh, really easy just by the simple vector construction of this total spin sum to zero. So you can always sum these to zero uh, for some fixed state for any given angle phi. So the ground state has some macroscopic degeneracy, but there are some dynamics in that ground state that really don't determine energy there And with more work, uh, you can also write this in terms of a divergence of the field. So you can also classify the Heisenberg anti-ferrament of the power of the lattice as something of a cool phase. Um, and then in this case, the experimental manifestation here would be an energy integrated neutron scattering measurement. You would see things, pinch points here in this sort of low tide like pattern. It looks different than the Ising model, uh, just because we have Heisenberg and ferromagnetic interactions here, uh, but we still have these pinch points which come from this divergence free condition, uh, the dipole correlations. Um, so, uh, as I said earlier, this is really an example classically of uh, something that you might call a cooperative paramagnet. Going by uh, John Lennon in 1979. Uh, we're really uh, can be thought of an example of the classical view on spin. The quantum limit, um, it's, it is an unsolved 
It turns out um, the experimental situation is also actually kind of murky. So this is something that people have been trying to study for a long time, and probably um, the best study in Heisenberg power core systems uh, are in the spinels, um, where you have, uh, say, manganese or chromium on the east side of the spinel lattice, which forms a power core. However, in all of these compounds, uh, there's an issue in that there's another energy scale which dominates over the exchange energy scales at uh, low temperatures. The result is essentially a structural transition. Uh, as shown here, this one particular compound, but this sort of structural transition uh, is common among all of these, all of these compounds. And the structural transition um, really strongly impacts a large portion of the magnetic band. You never actually really get to the regime where you can see the true expectations or the ground state of the Heisenberg. Uh, sort of represented here uh, by a sort of standard diagram of frustrated magnetism when we look at the uh, inverse extract uh, energy scale from the inverse magnetism. Um, and just about the point when you would enter into some regime uh, where the exchange energy scales dominate over the curious or dominate over the temperature energy scales, you have some knowledge here the behavior resulting uh, in the structure, in the structure, resulting from the structure. So we know that perturbations are essentially always going to be there in any real, real material. Um, but what we'd like to find is a case where the perturbations are small. Smaller than uh, energy scale, which are called, say, E and J here, associated with the dominant Heisenberg exchange energy scale. So there would be an axis of an experimental regime and temperature uh, that's larger than that perturbative energy scale, that's smaller than our exchange energy scale. So that we're really probing the intrinsic physics of the So to do that, um, we, in a sense, need new, new power core systems. Um, the problem is, well, there are many power cores that can be synthesized, the problem is that in most cases, the rare earth ions here, which sit on the B sides of this power core lattice, have very weak exchange. The exchange comes from uh, a very small overlapping power cores. So to have a very strong exchange that we can overcome these perturbation energy scales, what you really want uh, is to put a uh, transition metal, 3D transition metal, on power lines. However, that's a little bit problematic uh, in this particular formula here because it's difficult to find 3D transition metal ions which can satisfy charge balance or with uh, oxidation states that can satisfy charge balance when you have an oxygen um, So to overcome that, uh, Bob Cava and Jason Prisant came up uh, with these series of fluoride based power lines. So in this case, the fluorine has a 1 minus charge on it. So now you can satisfy charge balance in the power core structure. Uh, however, there's a little bit of a complication that now you need a charge of one and a half on the A side of the power core lattice. They use uh, a little bit of a trick of uh, chemistry and just mix charge of one plus and two points. So that's why this power core structure has a rather strange formula for power core lattices. We have uh, sodium and calcium mixed on the A side of the structure. And in any uh, sense of average measurements of this crystal structure, it looks like sodium and calcium are equally mixed or completely average on the of this structure. Essentially, if you solve this structure using neutron diffraction or X-ray diffraction, you just have to put some scattering element on the A site, which has the average of sodium and calcium So we do have some disorders uh, already intrinsically in the system. So what do the, the thermodynamics So in the nickel-based compound, we um, can see an inverse susceptibility here. It shows very nice Curie-Weiss behavior um, with very strong magnetic interaction. It's a Curie-Weiss uh, term minus one. Uh, magnetic moment consistent with the nickel two plus spin one three point seven, so it's a little bit uh, large. Um, but in addition to this nice Curie-Weiss behavior, um, we see there is some spin. Now there is a large regime where we can access the essential intrinsic physics of the Heisenberg model before the spin freezing starts to set in at about 3.5 Kelvin. The spin freezing looks like it's associated with essentially a uh, glassy transition. You can see that here in the uh, AC susceptibility, which was a frequency dependent, uh, frequency dependence of this peak, uh, and also this characteristic uh, splitting of the field pool versus zero field pool. So from this freezing temperature, we can make some estimates of the exchange disorder that arises in the system. We might uh, hypothesize that the exchange disorder has arisen because we have uh, 
ionic disorder. So the sodium and calcium is distorted inside of the cells. That exchange disorder on energy scale for spin one turns out to be about 0.2 m and NAD in some very rough estimates. Okay. Um, so what do the magnetic correlations look like? Or what can we really say about the component of the system? So in order to, in order to say something, we need to do some neutron scattering measurements. Um, and I'm going to discuss the neutron scattering measurements in, uh, in kind of a strange order. I'm going to discuss the excitations first with the inelastic data, and then I'll discuss uh, the elastic data. So there is elastic scattering here. There's no magnetic order, but there's some frozen state. That frozen state uh, seems rather unconventional. Um, and it turns out we get more information from just looking at the inelastic Uh, so here, I'm showing two slices of uh, inelastic neutron scattering data. Uh, this, these particular slices are taking at, taking at two millivolts energy transfer. There are two different scattering points. Um, you can see here these characteristic bow tie features of the Heisenberg model, uh, as well as these characteristic the square features of the other scattering point that you might expect. Uh, consistent uh, with you, what you might expect from uh, the energy integrated classical calculations for the Heisenberg uh, Although there are some discrepancies here. So in particular, uh, we're missing some spectral weight at the center of the square here, where the spectral weight should really peak. Um, as well, right at these uh, pinch points here, um, the spectral weight is not peaking, it's actually peaking a little bit off of the pinch points. Uh, so from this data right away, you'd say we have something that, that looks similar to the Heisenberg model, uh, but there are probably some motivations to that. Um, if we move up in energy, um, we can follow these excitations as they disperse out, transverse to the pinch points. Uh, and don't really do too much longitude ones with each ones. So they merge out into some broad continuum up here. This high Q scattering effect. Right away, we can tell um, from the absence of scattering at these different points that the magnetic interactions must be predominantly uh, anti ferromagnetic, uh, and there must be only very small uh, signal that comes from the sun. But we'd like to say something about the magnetic component of the system. We've seen essentially this slide uh, in almost every talk today. Um, magnetic interactions that we have to consider is this full exchange matrix that's allowed in each, each bond of the pyro lattice. Uh, we might also include next year's neighbor exchange terms. Uh, so this can be very complicated. Typically, uh, in a frustrated magnetic system, when you don't have spin waves, uh, what you can do is apply, say, a very large magnetic field to go into a field polarized paramagnetic state. Uh, and then you will have spin waves in that state, and you can fit those spin waves and extract exchange interactions. It turns out the exchange interactions in these transition metal power cores are far too strong to be able to polarize the system. With any reasonable deal with neutron scattering. Uh, so we have to do something a little bit different. Uh, we cannot fit the spin waves. Uh, of course, this was a this slide, this nice example of actually fitting these spin waves. Uh, not fit the spin waves, um, but we can look at the energy integrated data or the equal time structure factors, which I've shown here. Uh, we can actually also collect uh, a little bit more data to obtain some more information. Uh, in particular, polarizing neutron scattering measurements, which are shown here, uh, the spin flip and non spin flip channels uh, in this uh, HHL scattering. So, this particular scattering, this particular scattering. So, we have two scattering planes as well as polarized data, uh, which gives us information on the spin components. Uh, different directions. Again, right away from the polarized data, you can see these two data sets uh, look very similar. Um, so indicating that you have mostly Heisenberg-like interactions, uh, not like the spin axes that we presented earlier. Although there are some discrepancies, uh, notably the absence of intensity around this uh, over two point here in non-spin flip, where we do have some intensity in the spin flip channel. Uh, and if you look at the symmetry of this particular bottom line that I'm showing here, uh, Flipping the scattering intensity of that line, we lose that in the spin flip channel, where does that symmetry exist in uh, non spin flip channel? So these are all the features of the data that we have to explain. Um, we were able to capture these features uh, using something called a self consistent Gaussian approximation, effectively a mean field uh, approximation to calculate these correlations. The data is shown up top. Uh, a global fit to the data in the self consistent Gaussian approximation is shown at the bottom. We're able to capture the features of the spectra very well, um, refining parameters to include uh, nearest neighbor exchanges, which are predominantly Heisenberg, so all the diagonal elements are equal. 
uh, can dominate the system. Uh, but we also have some pop diagonals and dilutions in the board that it's kind of like soft in terms that are contributing uh, and are responsible for essentially these small differences here. Uh, in addition, there's an exponential difference. But we're essentially able to determine the Hamiltonian without know, refining to spin waves, uh, instead of applying to the equal time, equal time waves. So before I move on to discuss the energy resolved expectations, I just want to say a little bit about what sort of typical expectations we might expect to see um, in neutron scattering and so Because uh, in terms of the expectations in this nickel compound are very atypical. Um, right? So we're sort of familiar with, say, magnetically ordered systems where the excitations are transverse spin waves without some order direction. If you were to do a neutron scattering measurement, you would see these well-defined resonant modes. Um, if you look at, say, the momentum integrated spectral uh, spectrum, uh, sort of shown schematically down here, you find that neutron intensity is distributed in this zero energy or elastic channels as well as in elastic channels. Uh, in a well-defined way, uh, we have basically a total intensity that's, that's related to this by some of this S times S plus 1. Um, and of that total intensity, a uh, factor of S squared exists uh, in the elastic channels without any quantum corrections. Now, of course, we can have some quantum corrections or some excitations which say are longitudinal and reduce the size of this moment, transferring spectral weight out of here. But any spectral weight transfer from the elastic channel to the inelastic channel is essentially a quantum channel. Other systems that you might be familiar with are, say, balance bond ordered systems, where again we have the well defined resonance of resonant modes um, that are really just corresponding to breaking one of these valence salience bonds and then allowing them to hop, gaining momentum across the lattice. In this case, this, the uh, momentum integrated spectra is all inelastic uh, here, and everything is S on S. So this really uh, quantum dominated from the state. Uh, or in sort of the extreme quantum limit of the spin map chain, we have fractionalized excitations. In this case, the resident mode, the resident modes are replaced by essentially a continuum of excitations. The continuum rises because of the selection rules of uh, the neutron scatter. Can't excite just a single fractionalized spin map part of the um, And so in this case, you still see uh, spectral weight, which is entirely uh, inelastic and spread out <coughs> into a continuum. So the essential point being that spectral wave moving from the elastic to inelastic channels um, is essentially uh, quantum, quantum mechanical driven at, at zero temperature for the experiment. So these are the uh, energy resolved excitations that you see in the nickel-based compound. Uh, we observe not well-defined modes, but a continuum of excitations. So this is a uh, nice transfer perpendicular to the pinch points. Uh, and this is for transverse to the pinch points, and this is longitudinal uh, to the pinch points in two opposing directions. Um, if we look at the distribution of spectral weight, we actually see that the total signal does account for this S times S plus 1, or essentially uh, gives us a suitable set of magnetons. Um, but 90% of that spectral weight uh, is inelastic, at least within the resolution of these measurements. So this is some uh, frozen state down here. There is some spectral weight in elastic channels, but it's a really unconventional. Sort of now there's a continuum here, but there's a structure to that continuum. Uh, if you look more carefully, in this case I'm showing you just the spin plug channel and the polarized data, the same data. So we have this continuum scattering, but if you do a cut here in energy, um, you can see that there's a hump right at the pinch point. So some spectral weight is moving off uh, from zero energy transfers to non-zero energy transfers. Um, and we've already been able to uh, understand the Hamiltonian fairly well in this system. At least I think so. Um, and from that, we're looking for the only energy scale that can account for the spectral weight up here at four four millimoles is, is the Heisenberg exchange energy scale. There are no single line in that that can account for this. Right. So this must be a collective of uh, In addition, we can see that these modes disperse out of these two sort of pumps. Okay, but it's not all inelastic. There's some elastic scattering, um, and having knowledge of the Hamiltonian, um, we can then use the elastic scattering shown here. We can simulate that Hamiltonian with more Carlos simulations and try to understand uh, the nature of this kind of unconventional frozen state. So first, I would just say that the elastic scattering, the neutron scattering measurement turns on a higher temperature than the freezing temperature measured by its susceptibility. So just stronger evidence that we have some glassy-like freezing state. 
Um, but if we use uh, Monte Carlo simulations to try to capture uh, these correlations, so the last data here, uh, classical Monte Carlo simulations shown here, we can then take those Monte Carlo simulations and, and explore the local order on individual tetrahedron. What does this frozen state actually look like locally? And that's what we're trying to capture here. Um, it turns out that the frozen state spin configurations fall predominantly within this uh, total spin zero manifold. So predominantly the states of the Heisenberg anti-parallel that we would expect. Uh, we can characterize those states using this fairly complex set of order parameters. Um, so these two order parameters just characterize the relative orientations of spins on individual tetrahedral. Uh, here I just histogram all the all the possible configurations that fall within the states for the pure Heisenberg model, uh, as well as for the parameters relevant for the uh, and we see that um, although there is some larger spread in the nickel compound, they're largely very similar. But again, uh, the point is that the low energy frozen states are essentially just the states of the Heisenberg anti-ferromagnetic anti manifold. Uh, uh, so we have essentially what it looks like is happening is we, the disorder potential has come in and just frozen out, just captured these states in time as we cool down below the disorder. Potential. It's essentially kinetically less. So just to summarize and sort of show kind of last year the specific heat, which captures all of those energy scales. So there's just a magnetic specific heat. At high temperatures, um, our Heisenberg or Monte Carlo results overlay uh, exactly, or very nearly exactly with the high, uh, with the data, demonstrating that we have uh, at least high temperature uh, cooperative paramagnet. At low temperatures, we enter some quantum regime. Um, and then at the lowest temperatures, there's a small pink specific heat below the freezing energy scale. We see a small change, this uh, strange power law behavior, indicating we're in this sort of uh, frozen state. Um, if you look at the, the total magnetic entropy from integrating the specific heat, we do capture some residual entropy. Um, this entropy doesn't come out from simple counting arguments, um, but it is uh, essentially comparable in number to the fraction of spectral rate, uh, which is elastic. So essentially, uh, more evidence uh, that the system has been kicked out of early distance essentially just capture these low energy states in this classic uh, system. So we have uh, essentially at high energies, uh, the magnetic implications of the Heisenberg and the on the power of the lines, uh, and at lower energies, some unconventional uh, frozen subset of the states. Um, so in conclusion, um, I essentially leave a uh, number of questions uh, because this is important. Uh, we're really uh, essentially some theoretical support to understand what uh, is actually happening in these excitations. So clearly, uh, quantum is playing some part in the transferring the spectral wave uh, to the elastic channels. Um, but, but what uh, are the real excitations of the lines? Is there fractionalization? Uh, or is it simply a system that does not support quantum?
So you kind of, that's where you have these, these little clusters of sort of Ask uh, what's known about the uh, the uh, correlated disorder uh, between the sodium and the calcium, and in particular, uh, when you show this the spin polarized data, uh, could you be picking up a diffuse scattering of that sort of disorder in the long spin um, So. Yeah, it would have to be shown, and, and you know, this is an attempt 
to extract the world, that's what physics. Uh, and it's, it's, there's no obvious, no obvious features on this here in the nuclear scale. I don't know. Yeah, this is still a lot of work analysis there. That's certainly an interesting question. Yeah, one really quick question.